Hi, my name is Julie Fink with the Front Porch People. We'd like to thank Visible Voice Books for sponsoring the Novel Conversations giveaway, which gives listeners a chance to win all eight classic novels featured in our third season. Visible Voice Books is our local go-to for delving into our favorite books in a relaxed, inviting environment. And if you're not here in Cleveland, Ohio, you can always support Visible Voice Books by shopping online at visiblevoicebooks.com. Hello and welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo and this is Novel Conversations. Today I'm having a conversation about the novel Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Babbitt is a pungent satire about a man who typifies complacent mediocrity. George F. Babbitt, as standardized as his electric cigar lighter, revels in his own popularity, his ability to make money, his fine automobile, and his penny-pinching generosity. And now let me welcome our Novel Conversation readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. Joan, Patrick. Hello, Frank. Hello, Frank. So, Joan, let me ask you, is this the first time you read Babbitt? First time. Did you enjoy it? It's not a page turner, but it is certainly an interesting book. It does evoke a lot of reaction from the reader, at least from me. Patrick, how about you? First time for Babbitt? First time for Babbitt. I did enjoy it, as long as you keep in mind the type of book it is. What type of book is that? It is a satire, and that's what drives the story and drives the book. Right. The story of George Babbitt is basically the hook that Sinclair Lewis uses in order for him to give us the satire about capitalism, about labor unions, about religion, about politics. And you really have to keep that in mind because as you're reading the book, you just want to strangle him sometimes. (laughs) You just want to say, but just two minutes ago, you said the exact opposite of what you're saying now. This was a man full of convictions who had no conviction. He was full of convictions with no principles. With no principle, sure. And he never seems to recognize the hypocrisy. That's right. Sinclair Lewis has put him there for us to recognize the hypocrisy and the lack of principle that George Babbitt has. Babbitt never really comes to the realization himself. No, but he does have flashes of humanity throughout the book, which keep you rooting somewhat for Babbitt. That's right. Let's be clear. The story never becomes a caricature. George Babbitt is a serious person. He believes in what he believes in fully. So we don't hate him. Right. I mean, we see our frailties in his frailties. He never becomes someone we can't relate to. Throughout the whole novel, there's instances where he's trying to quit smoking. Now, maybe some of us haven't had to try to quit smoking, but we've all had bad habits that we've tried to break, and we can sympathize with his inability to stop smoking. We can relate to him. And even though sometimes his swings of logic make us a little dizzy, this never soars into unbelievability. At least it didn't for me. Not for me either. And I think that perhaps was one of Sinclair Lewis's main goal, that he gets me or the reader complacent in our smugness towards Babbitt. And then all of a sudden I recognize, oh, I did that too. (laughs) Exactly. Right. If you can't see yourself in these characters, then you're not looking. Then you're not looking. And the satire is not successful from an author's point of view, I think, because if the characters are so grotesque that you can't identify with them as a reader, then it doesn't work for the author because he wants you to see yourselves in these characters to some degree for the satire to be successful. Really, the satire starts within the first three or four paragraphs as Sinclair Lewis describes Babbitt and his house. We meet George as he's waking up in his 1920s Floral Heights home in Zenith. Right, and we don't really know where Zenith is, but we know it's a large Midwestern city somewhere around Chicago. It's certainly in the Midwest. I think they say there's three or 400,000 people in it. So it's a large town with industry. And George is very proud of his Floral Heights home. And this is right where Sinclair Lewis starts his satire. It's only the second paragraph. And while he's describing this beautiful middle-class home, he describes some of the furniture much like mahogany. And the bureau with its great clear mirror and Mrs. Babbitt's dressing table with toilet articles of almost solid silver. (laughs) He even goes on to tell us how if people had ever lived and loved here, read thrillers at midnight and lain in beautiful indolence on a Sunday morning, there were no signs of it. That's right. And Patrick, what's the last line of that chapter? In fact, there was but one thing wrong with the Babbitt house. It was not a home. I'm already a little depressed. (laughs) Definitely. But fortunately for Babbitt and his wife and kids, They're completely unaware of this. In fact, the fact that their house is standardized and probably identical to every third house on their street is a source of reassurance and comfort to George. And almost pride. Yes. 
he doesn't want to be out of the mainstream. He wants his house to be just like the other houses. He wants his car, although an expensive one, to be like the other expensive cars on the street. Right. Then he goes down to breakfast, and it says that often of a morning, Babbitt came bouncing and jesting into breakfast. Absolutely. No, he's happy in this life, for now. For now. Tell me a little bit about his family. Patrick? Well, there's Mrs. Babbitt, Myra. I'll let Lewis describe her. She had become so dully habituated to married life that in her full matronliness, no one, save perhaps Tinka, her 10-year-old, was at all interested in her or entirely aware that she was alive. So this is Mrs. Babbitt. Who is Tinka? Tinka is the youngest of the Babbage's three children. The oldest is Verona, or Roan, as she's called. She's 22 years old, just out of Bryn Mawr. Next, we have Ted, a 17-year-old high school student, and Tinka, the 10-year-old. Now, Verona is our first indication that conformity does not necessarily extend throughout this entire Babbage family. Well, she does strike you as the typical college co-ed who comes home from school with all sorts of progressive ideas that the father of the household's not going to like. Right. The father of the household wants her to settle down to a very prosperous job of being a secretary. Correct. She wants to go out and run what they call the welfare department. She wanted to do social service work. Work in a settlement house. Help the poor. And that was not what George Babbitt had in mind. Sounds vaguely socialist to George. Right. Socialism to him smacks of handouts and laziness. And most importantly, labor unrest and the effect it would have on business. That's right. The labor unions. All right. You mentioned Ted. Ted is in high school. And Ted is, I think, a typical 17-year-old boy who's much more interested in motor cars and what makes them run and maybe some girls and what makes them run as opposed to going on to higher education and then going on to run the world. Right. That's George Babbitt's plan for his son, Ted. Things he thought he was capable of doing when he was in college, but never got to it. Right, but he doesn't dwell a whole lot on that. He doesn't dwell a whole lot on his own failures, nor frankly does he dwell that much on any of his children through most of the book. Right, through most of the book, although there are going to be some moments towards the end where he does have some regrets for the way his life turned out. Yes. Well, why don't we send George Babbitt to work? George is a real estate agent. No, wait, I'm sorry. He would prefer to be called... I'm sorry, a realtor. There you go, thanks. He is in partnership with his father-in-law in a fairly successful real estate office in Zenith. And he certainly thinks of himself as a hard-working businessman, but when you follow him through the day, he doesn't seem to do a whole lot every day. He comes in a little after nine, it seems, dictates a few letters, goes out for a two-hour lunch, comes back and seems to leave before all his other employees. But he certainly thinks that what he does is very important. He thinks without realtors, there can be no towns. Someone's got to sell the property to the first homesteaders. Exactly. He thinks that no town could have ever sprung up anywhere in the world, but for the fact that there was a realtor there to first sell them the land so they could build the building or build the home or put the rail line through. He's very proud of what he knows about being a realtor and what he knows about the city of Zenith. But Sinclair Lewis is pretty quick to show us that his knowledge is somewhat shallow. There's a great quote here. Though he did know the market price, inch by inch, of certain districts of Zenith, he did not know whether the police force was too large or too small, whether it was in alliance with gambling and prostitution. He knew the means of fireproofing buildings and the relation of insurance rates to fireproofing, but he didn't know how many firemen there were in the city, how they were trained, paid, or how complete their apparatus. He sang eloquently the advantages of proximity of school buildings to rentable homes, but he did not know. He did not know that it was worthwhile to know whether the school rooms were properly heated, lighted, ventilated, and furnished. He didn't know how the teachers were chosen, and though he chanted, one of the boasts of Zenith is that we pay our teachers adequately, he himself could not have given the average salary of teachers in Zenith or anywhere else. So his knowledge is broad but not very deep, and he really only knows what he cares about. And he thinks that's enough. And for the most part it is. Besides, he's very busy quitting smoking. Yeah, every day, sometimes more than once a day. Right, but George congratulates himself on the success that he has quitting smoking. The success for him is not actually in stopping smoking, but in resolving that he will quit smoking. Right. He stopped smoking at least once a month. He went through with it like the solid citizen he was. He did everything, in fact, except stop smoking. And again, I think this is how Lewis humanizes Babbitt, makes him less of a caricature so we can see our frailties in him and we can relate a little bit. Well, it's another example of Babbitt is really sort of an empty vessel. All of his opinions come from somewhere else. 
And just like, as anyone knows, stopping smoking or doing any of those things require sort of an interior willpower, Babbitt doesn't rely on that. The way he's going to quit smoking is by doing these little stunts where he hides his cigarettes out in the office and then he locks the drawer they're in and he rationalizes to himself, well, I won't embarrass myself in front of my employees by going out to the office to get a cigar every 10 minutes. So that will keep me from smoking. Which on its own is not such a bad idea, but it doesn't work. Well, in the end, he just goes out and he buys more cigars himself. So he just gives up on his resolve. He doesn't embarrass himself by bumming cigars or cigarettes. He just goes out and buys it again and starts all over. I guess for me, I use this whole story as an example of how George Babbitt is more concerned with his social standing and maintaining that social status than he is with just about anything else. His happiness, his self-esteem, everything is a product of how others see him, how others react to him. And really, every afternoon, he was off to a club, Chamber of Commerce, Boosters. He belonged to a lot of these organizations, and that's where he derived his social stability, not necessarily his social status. His social esteem. And it is fertile ground for Lewis, these men's clubs, from the Zenith Athletic Club to the Boosters, the Elks, Rotarians. Workers of the world. I mean, every man could find an organization or a club that he could join and derive something from. And not only could, but should. And did. He wants to have, he wants to know what every other man in these groups know. Although it often seems to be about the weather. Cars. Cars. Which is reminiscent of Sinclair Lewis's Main Street. But there's a lot of talk about politics in these groups. True, there's more here. Especially when it comes to, as we said before, labor unions, foreigners. They're very sure of their opinions. They're just not very clear. And Sinclair Lewis demonstrates this perfectly with a few lines about labor unions. He puts the words, I think, in George Babbitt's mouth. Patrick, do you have that quote? A good labor union is of value because it keeps out radical unions, which would destroy property. No one ought to be forced to belong to a union, however. All labor agitators who try to force men to join a union should be hanged. In fact, just between ourselves, there oughtn't to be any unions allowed at all. And as it's the best way of fighting the unions, every businessman ought to belong to an employer's association and to the Chamber of Commerce. In union, there is strength. So any selfish hog who doesn't join the Chamber of Commerce ought to be forced to. Boy, the hypocrisy there to us is startling. To them, it's unnoticeable. And that is a device that Lewis uses throughout the book. There was an earlier passage where Babbitt is reading the paper to his wife in the morning and commenting on the stories. Again, he's talking about some labor agitators. He says, And we got no business interfering with the Irish or any other foreign government. Keep our hands strictly off. And there's another well-authenticated rumor from Russia that Lenin is dead. That's fine. It's beyond me why we don't just step in there and kick those Bolshevik cusses out. So here we have one sentence saying we should keep our hands off and not get involved in other countries, and the very next sentence, we should step in. But Babbitt is blithely unaware of any contradiction in these ideas. But Sinclair Lewis loves to point them out to us. He wants us to see these inconsistencies or this hypocrisy. And it's not subtle. Yeah, he keeps them, as you see, within one sentence or certainly within paragraphs, he'll make the turn. Very cutting stuff. Right, so when you're not annoyed with them, you can laugh. Absolutely. And I did more than once. But Babbitt does have one friend that sort of allows another side of Babbitt to come through. And it's his friend Paul from college, who's also in business in Zenith, but has never felt as comfortable in the business world as everybody else did. And Babbitt has lunch with Paul fairly regularly at one of these clubs. And he's talking to Paul and he says, you know, I'm always blowing to Myra and the kids about what a whale of a realtor I am. And yet sometimes I get a sneaking idea I'm not such a Pierpont Morgan as I let on to be. So there's something going on in Babbitt that says that he knows all is not perfect in his world. Right, and we'll talk a little bit more about Paul later on in our discussion. But you're right, I see Paul as almost an alter ego for George Babbitt. Sure, yeah. But we'll get to that. Right now what I want to talk about is the big social event on George Babbitt's calendar, and that's a dinner party that he's throwing for some of his best friends. The de rigueur dinner party that Myra, his wife, really wants because... That's what you do when you have a house in Floral Heights, is you look at all the magazines and you try to have a dinner party that matches all those pictures. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about that party. This is where you learn the town has a seedy side, because he has to get the alcohol for the dinner. But I thought there was prohibition. Right, this is the 1920s, so there is prohibition, but it's always available somewhere. And George, of course, knows where to go, and there's a little game that goes on at these parties 
where the host sort of waits and waits and everyone sort of wonders, is he going to bring out any booze? And again, the hypocrisy shows itself during the party. They all actually think prohibition is not necessarily a bad idea for the lower classes, but for people that can hold their liquor, there should be no prohibition, and so they wink at the law. Right. For the working man, if it's going to keep him from work the next day, then prohibition. But for George and his friends, it's an imposition on their personal freedom and liberty. So, Joan, when they start talking about this party, we're led to believe it's going to be the social event of the season here in Floral Heights. But once the guests show up and we're told who they are, it's not such a big deal, is it? Essentially, it's a bunch of his neighbors who are all relatively prosperous businessmen and their wives, the most prominent of which is a gentleman called Chum Frink, and he fashions himself a poet. But Patrick, he's not really a poet. He writes rhymes, but... He writes pomulations. <laughs> They're ad jingles. But in Floral Heights, he is considered a poet. The poet laureate of Floral Heights. Yes, and so George is very proud to have a literary figure at his dinner party. And also his next-door neighbor, who is a Ph.D. in philosophy. But we learn, really, what he does is he supplies PR and statistics to the local streetcar company. So essentially, it's a dinner party of people just like George and Myra. Exactly. Not their betters, not their worse, just with all the same hypocrisies that we've seen in George Babbitt. Very much so. And the dinner party is rated a success or not based on how much it is like all the other dinner parties thrown in Floral Heights. The menus are the same. The ice cream comes from the same caterer. It better come from that caterer. Exactly. So again, we see standardization and conformity is a key to success here. And it's funny, one of the conversations that goes on during the party is them talking about small town folk and, you know, they're salt of the earth people, but oh, are they boring. Boy, they don't have much to say. They talk about the weather and cars. George calls them the Main Street Bergs. And then they all go on to talk about the weather and cars. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. Patrick, earlier in our discussion, you mentioned that there was a moment where George shows his humanity towards his wife. And I think it comes after this dinner party. Yes, just as they're closing the door on the last guest, George is thinking to himself, I got through it. But for a while there, I didn't hardly think I'd last out. He prepared to taste that most delicate pleasure of the host, making fun of his guests in the relaxation of midnight. As the door closed, he yawned voluptuously, chest out, shoulders wriggling, and turned cynically to his wife. She was beaming. Oh, it was nice, wasn't it? I know they enjoyed every minute of it, don't you think? He couldn't do it. He couldn't mock. It would have been like sneering at a happy child. He lied ponderously. You bet. Best party of the year by a long shot. So there's an example of Babbitt's humanity. He wants to turn to his wife and make fun of the dinner, which she worked so hard on. Which he seemed to recognize really was like every other dinner party there ever was. Exactly. But she is beaming. She's happy with the party. And he realizes it would be too cruel to criticize the party in any way. But actually, right after that compliment, he lets another shoe drop. Things are going to change for their relationship. That's right. When he was at lunch with his closest friend, Paul, his old college roommate, they had a little scheme. Apparently, the two families go up to Maine in the summer to a cabin on a lake. Paul and George have a plan to go up ahead of the women this year and try and spend a week alone without the families. Doing manly things. Doing manly things, right. And at first, he has an elaborate lie he's going to tell about how he has to go on to New York and see a man about business. So when he's done there, he'll just go up to Maine because there's no point in coming back to Zenith and then going back out to Maine again. But he doesn't resort to that lie here with Myra. He sort of has almost of a little breakdown here. He confesses to being tired and nervous and a little overwrought, and he really needs to just get away by himself. Their destination is a fishing cabin on a lake where Paul and George will be able to hang out together, play poker with the guides. For about a week, I think, right? And then the women and the kids are going to join them. But they're staying up late, smoking cigars, playing cards, sleeping in. But the talk gets personal. 
We leave the boosterism, we leave the capital letters behind us in Zenith. And in Maine, George and Paul can really talk. They're talking as two old friends would talk. Sinclair Lewis writes it this way. They did not talk much, but when they did talk, they slipped into the naive intimacy of college days. Babbitt drew his hand through the cool flood and mused. We never thought we'd come to Maine together. No, we've never done anything the way we thought we would. Paul says, I expected to live in Germany with my granddad's people and study to fiddle. That's so. And remember how I wanted to be a lawyer and go into politics? So their conversation turns to lost opportunities, lost dreams. I felt it was some of the most human conversation in the whole book. And we now know Paul's not happy, and we know George isn't happy. Right, but whereas up to this point in the story, George's unhappiness has been revealed subconsciously in his dreams, Paul is more visibly unhappy throughout the day. He's more conscious of it. This trip to Maine really is a turning point for both George and Paul. When they get back to Zenith, things change drastically. Sure, when George gets back, he feels all full of life and vigor. And he is going to become the number one realtor in Zenith and the number one booster of the city of Zenith. And he really does reach his, let's call it, his Zenith, while Paul reaches his nadir. Right. Babbitt becomes a great orator, much to my surprise. He writes one speech and gives it pretty well. And, of course, he gets a glowing review in the newspaper because he bought that review. And it goes from there. He's asked to make other speeches. There's a mayoral campaign going on in Zenith, and that gives sort of a platform for George to go out on behalf of one of the candidates. And because of the exposure in the newspaper, it raises his visibility a little bit. Right. Because of his new social status, he's now offered a deal with a big banker in town. There's actually a whole set of scenes about this English lord that comes to Zenith and how he doesn't get invited to that party, but then he ends up friendly with him at another time. And so now people think he's got English royalty as his friends. And then the big contractor in town, Charles McKelvey, is willing to deal with him. He actually attends another dinner party, a higher social status dinner party that the Babbitts have. Right. For George and Myra, this is a coup to actually get this couple to come to their house for the dinner party. But it doesn't go quite as well as their first dinner party, does it? She cries herself to sleep that night. Well, it was awkward because it becomes very clear that the McKelveys are just there because of business reasons. It's clear that the McKelveys were slumming that night, and George and Myra are not going to follow them up to the next level of social strata. But now this is where Sinclair Lewis, again, I think becomes brutal. He has the Babbitts invited to a dinner party they don't want to go to. Right. When the McKelveys are leaving, the Babbitts are hinting around for that return invitation, which does not come. And it's very, very painful, particularly to Myra. And then the Babbitts turn around and have to deal with the Overbrooks. And when the Overbrooks want a return engagement, they never get one. I think that's brutal stuff. It sure is, too, because Lewis seems to make it clear that the Babbitts, while crushed, already have a certain social status, so they'll be okay. For the Overbrooks, that was their shot, and it didn't work for them. But Patrick, this momentary social setback doesn't prevent George Babbitt from reaching his zenith. That's right. His prominence in the community with the speeches that he has been giving give rise to his election to the first vice presidency of the Zenith Booster Club. And it is on this day, his greatest triumph, he's brought down by the news that his best friend Paul has just shot and seriously wounded his wife, Zilla. And we hear about that shooting almost as matter-of-factly as you just said it. George Babbitt calls his wife to tell him his great news, and she says, Paul just shot his wife. And this is really where George's world starts to crumble. Now George Babbitt begins to question everything that he thought he knew. Such as? He looks at the relationship with his family quite differently, especially with his wife. He looks at his relationship with God. He certainly looks at his political affiliations. He even questions the value of his work. Everything George Babbitt believed in, as embodied by the life of Paul, has been called into question. He has no anchor anymore. The social status and social standing that he sought means nothing to him anymore. And how does this questioning and this destruction start to manifest itself? Well, he withdraws from pretty much everybody, family, work, society. But because he's built up this social capital, everybody is willing to say, well, George has had a hard time lately. And for a while, they're still accepting of him. 
But Patrick, it's more than just a withdrawal. He's taking active steps away. That's right. His wife takes a couple trips out of town, which give George an opportunity to enjoy a little freedom. And he actually begins having an affair with one of his clients, a woman who came into the office looking for an apartment to rent. But it's not only the other women. He starts drinking to excess. He's smoking to excess. And now he thinks liberal Seneca Doan, who was a progressive political figure not well appreciated in Zenith, has something of value to say to the world. Exactly. During all of this questioning that George Babbitt's doing, he happens to have a conversation with this socialist activist lawyer, and he doesn't think the guy's crazy. Doan seems to take the place of Paul in his life at this moment. Paul is now in prison and is no longer an influence on George. Seneca Doan, also a college buddy, he sort of reminds George of what his ideals were back then, how he was going to be a lawyer and help the poor. Well, Doan did actually become a lawyer, and he does work with the labor unions. Right. So after this conversation with Doan, he shocks the other men at the Chamber of Commerce and the boosters meetings, which at this time he's still sort of going, by saying that Doan isn't such a bad guy, that maybe what he says has got some value. It's become personalized. It's no longer those socialists or those anarchists. It's this liberal lawyer, Seneca, who I used to go to college with. So I think it's moderated his opinion a little bit. Right, and at first it draws nothing but slightly raised eyebrows. Well, tied in with everything else, the neighbors see him coming in late drunk. Another neighbor sees him coming out of a movie theater with a woman who's clearly not his wife. Another time he's spotted driving a car down an icy road with another woman in the car. So in totality, yes, eyebrows are beginning to be raised. And they're talking about George behind his back. They're wondering what's up with him. That's right. And that's where George gets a little bit of a backbone. Again, one of the innumerable leagues is being formed in town, the Good Citizens League. They want him to become a member, and he's just not interested this time. Right. And that's another sign to his friends that there's something wrong with George. Right. Because this is a kind of group he would have joined right away. It's all about keeping out the socialists and the unions and the foreigners. And he doesn't want to be bullied. Absolutely. That was another thing. He It was one thing to just have an invitation, but below the first couple invitations, there was not quite a threat, but he was being told to join this group, not invited to join it. We think you're going down the wrong track, George. Things seem to be falling apart in your life a little bit. You're making some comments and hanging out with people that we're not too sure about. You need to prove to us you're still one of the good old guys by joining our group. Right, and he didn't want to be bullied. But things are going to change again for George Babbitt. Well, his wife, Myra, who's been away, ostensibly visiting relatives for a couple months, which allowed George to live this raucous life, comes back to town and ends up sick. At first, it seems dire. And as you might expect, that changes him again. And it gives him a second chance with his social life. Right. Almost losing his wife makes him reevaluate where he is in his life right now. I don't think Sinclair Lewis is telling us he now realizes he loves his wife, but I think Sinclair Lewis is telling us he now realizes there are many aspects of his life that he loved, and he's at risk of losing them, and he takes a step back from that progressive precipice. Right. In the wake of his wife's illness and her recovery, there is an air of resignation, I think, about George. He's not going to quite go back to his old life, but he's not going to lead this new progressive life either. It seems like he's going to live his life in the future, perhaps a little vicariously through his son, Ted, who now makes a reappearance. A grand reappearance. Yes. Ted has been dating... The girl next door. The girl next door. Eunice. Eunice Littlefield, daughter of the resident philosopher in Floral Heights. And when Ted and Eunice fail to return from a party one night, they're found in the morning in Ted's bed, and they've gone off and eloped. Ted, at this point, I think is a freshman in college. Of course, the families are up in arms. George takes Ted aside, and he says to Ted, I don't know, but I do get a kind of sneaking pleasure out of the fact that you knew what you wanted to do and you did it. Well, those folks in there will try to bully you and tame you down. Tell them to go to the devil. I'll back you. Take your factory job if you want to. Don't be scared of the family, nor all of Zenith, nor of yourself the way I've been. Go ahead, old man. The world is yours. So there we see George putting what were once his dreams on his son and encouraging him to not fall into the rut that George fell into. Pursue those dreams. Don't let them wither away. And that's where our novel ends. Potentially happily ever after. Well, yes, we've had a change. We've had a change in George. I think we've had a change in the relationship between George and Myra. 
We've certainly had a change in the potential life that Ted's going to lead. I think it's a positive ending. And with that, I'd like you to share some of your favorite moments or quotes from the book that we just haven't had a chance to talk about yet. All right, Joan, do you have some moments or a quote that you want to share with us that we haven't had a chance to talk about? Well, there's lots of fun passages in here because the whole thing is so satirical. Lewis is constantly pointing out the hypocrisies or just the inanities of daily life in Zenith. Not necessarily so different from daily life today. And there's one passage where he talks about everybody in Zenith is hustling. Everybody is busy. It's such a busy city. And he writes, Men were hustling to catch trains to hustle through the vacations which the hustling doctors had ordered. Among them, Babbitt hustled back to his office to sit down with nothing much to do except see that the staff looked as though they were hustling. Very good. Patrick? I do have a passage from a scene early in the book where George is going through the newspaper. Of course, he's commenting on all the stories. And he comes across one that talks about how a fellow was inaugurated as mayor in a nearby town wearing overalls. And he was also a preacher. And George thinks to himself, he searched for an attitude, but neither as a Republican, a Presbyterian, an elk, nor a real estate broker did he have any doctrine about preacher mayors laid down for him. So he grunted and went on. So it's just an example of how, since he didn't have a ready-made opinion that had been handed out to him, an editorial written for him in the paper, he didn't know what to think about this, so he didn't think anything of it. But it wasn't only just the news he read the paper for. Here's one of my favorite quotes. Babbitt looked up irritably from the comic strips in The Evening Advocate. They composed his favorite literature and art, these illustrated chronicles in which Mr. Mutt hit Mr. Jeff with a rotten egg and mother corrected father's vulgarisms by means of a rolling pin. (laughs) I enjoyed that. And then there's Babbitt's affair with Tannis, and we didn't get into the affair very much at all, but at least for a while during this affair, Babbitt feels very proud of himself, that he now has a woman that he can talk to, that they can have conversations with. Here is an example of Tannis's contributions to their conversations. Don't you think it's awfully nice when two people who have so much, what shall I call it, so much analysis, that they can discard all these stupid conventions and understand each other, and become acquainted right away, like ships that pass in the night. Yes, she really gets it. I have another one here that I've got to read. George Babbitt's talking about a Civil War veteran, one of the oldest citizens in Zenith. He had never ridden in a motor car, never seen a bathtub, never read any books save the Bible, McGuffey's readers, and religious tracts, and he believed that the earth is flat, that the English are the lost ten tribes of Israel, and that the United States is a democracy. Yeah, it's almost confusing when you're reading the book. Do you want to agree and cheer him on, or do you want to think, oh, no, wait a minute, there are some things that can be believed? Well, can't we do as George Babbitt does and believe it and not believe it all at the same time? (laughs) (laughs) Patrick, anything else? Yeah, there was another passage where George begins to question his philosophy, I think. He's been granted an interview with Mr. Ethorn, who is one of the patriarchs of town, one of the original founders. He's the owner of the First State Bank of Zenith. He's Zenith's richest and most powerful citizen. George is looking at him, and he marvels to himself. That little fuzzy face there, why, he could make or break me if he told my banker to call my loans. Gosh, that quarter-sized squirt, and looking like he hadn't got a single bit of hustle to him. I wonder, do we boosters throw too many fits about pep? And that sort of brings in another thing which we didn't mention too much, but the lingo, the slang that runs throughout this book about hustle and pep. And zowie and zip. And zip and zing. And vision and ideas, and they're all capitalized. Right, exactly. And here he looks at this withered old man who holds all the power in town, and he begins to question, now maybe all this bluster about pep and vision and hustle, maybe we make too much of this. And then, again, you have the family social satire. Here's one where um, Ted shows up again mid-story, and he's having a party at the house. And what do you know? The kids are drinking. This shocks Babbitt, of course. And he meets his wife in the pantry to talk about it. He says, I'd like to go in there and throw some of those young pups out of the house. They talked down to me like I was the butler. I'd like to. I know, she sighed. Only everybody says, all the mothers tell me, unless you stand for them. If you get angry because they go out to their cars to have a drink, they won't come to your house anymore. And we wouldn't want Ted left out of things, would we? He announced that he would be enchanted to have Ted left out of things, 
and hurried in to be polite, lest Ted be left out of things. <laughs> Amazing stuff. And with that, we'll take leave of George Babbitt, the novel by Sinclair Lewis. Joan, Patrick, I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me. Thanks, Frank, and see you next time. So long, Frank. Joining me now for our EndNote segment on our novel is author and researcher Ted Schwartz. Ted, welcome to Novel Conversations. Thank you. Good to be here. When we talked about Sinclair Lewis during our EndNote segment for his first novel, Main Street, we talked about how the small town that he used for that novel was really based on his small town where he had grown up. Now in Babbitt, we've moved to a larger town and we've got a bigger man. Is he still using autobiographical information? Yes and no. Zenith was interesting. He laid out a huge piece of paper on a table and drew a very detailed map of this fantasy community based on places he had known in Minnesota. And that was how Zenith was created. So Zenith was created out of tablecloth? Definitely. And what parts are yes to the autobiographical question? When Sinclair Lewis was young, he thought he would become the man he wrote about as George Babbitt. He planned to go to work in the bank, work his way up to the head of the bank, and therefore he would be a businessman, highly respected in the community, as was standard in Sauk Center, where he was raised. Eventually, since he didn't go into banking and was interested in writing and began working in publishing after he left Yale, his next idea was to own a small-town newspaper. Did he think owning a newspaper would give him that sort of middle-class respectability that he thought he'd get as a banker or perhaps a realtor? As a newspaper editor, he would have had the power of the press, People would have been coming to him for favors. He would have had an influence in any town change. So, yes, that would have made him a very prominent person. Did he buy a newspaper? No, he tried. December 18, 1918, he contacted a broker to start looking for a property. He was very specific as to what he wanted. I want a weekly newspaper, complete plant, and goodwill in a town of from 1,500 to 7,000. And he went on from there with other specifics. So this was a respected journal that he would take over and I would assume by kind of osmosis become the respected owner. You know, I find it interesting though, Ted, as you know, most of the characters in Babbitt are flawed. Did Sinclair Lewis really want to become one of these characters that he was satirizing and writing about? These frauds, these phonies? I don't think he wanted to become one. I think he saw that side of himself in it. He was known to be a practical joker who liked to put himself down. One time he was in New York for a business meeting, very tired. It was a suite of rooms in his hotel, went into the bedroom to nap. The people he was to meet arrived, and out came an old man. He explained that his son was napping, that he was Sinclair Lewis's father, and that he couldn't stand his son. He started going into the hypocrisy of Sinclair Lewis and just ripping him to shreds. And then he ripped off his wig, the whole disguise. It was a practical joke. He was very much aware of who he was or perceived himself to be, both good and very much humanly corrupted. Ted, that's a fun story. I don't know where you come up with these stories, but I sure do enjoy them. All right, let me ask you. Essentially, what he wanted was to be a success. Was Babbitt successful? I know Main Street sold very well. Well, he was and he wasn't successful. Now, Babbitt sold 350,000 copies the first 14 years. That sounds pretty successful for 1923. He admitted that he could earn 250,000 a year. Now, we're talking the 1930s at this point. He was making that kind of money even after 10 years? Yes, one of the highest paid people in the country at that time. The book became increasingly successful. His earlier work became increasingly successful. And what gets interesting is that he loses any small town credibility. He does not achieve the kind of respect he sought as a young man. And I think it's on that we'll end our end note segment today, Ted, on our novel, Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Again, I want to thank you for coming in and having your EndNote segment with me. Good to be here. Before we leave, I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews, for coming in and having a conversation with me today about the novel Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. Listen to more great conversations at thefrontporchpeople.com. Thank you for listening. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. 
This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.